Thank you everybody for joining us here at the California Horticultural Society August meeting. And um, like I said, we'll have the plant forum. I want to thank Charlotte and Judy, Connie, Robbie, Richard, and Angelica. She's my buddy from that I was supposed to be visiting in um, Chicago. So she's contributed this month. It's going to be kind of fun for sharing and contributing for this month's meeting. And I want to encourage everybody else, send in your stuff. I looked in my garden this um, month and there was absolutely nothing in bloom. But even, you know, highlights, insights, disasters, anything you want to show off that you particularly like, pests that you don't like, what is this? We have a couple of those this evening. So um, coming up at seven, we'll have Mike Boss from Hidden Forest Nursery. And that's Sonoma Horticultural Nursery. And evidently they have a... Well, I've been to the garden, but I didn't realize it was all planted. I thought it was originally a natural forest of redwoods and such, but evidently that was all planted. And he'll give you a backstory on all that and how he had saved it from developers and such like that. So that's on it um, at seven. So Charlotte, you are up first with your beautiful Nyrene. Okay, this was um, from the San Francisco Botanical Garden sale many years ago, and um, I planted it in a new container this last year, and um, it surprised me with a pretty blossom. Gorgeous. Evidently, this one is summer green. It blooms with leaves. That's what I read about it. Oh, um, yeah, it's had leaves all summer. Evidently, it's from the uh, Eastern Cape province where it uh, rains in the summer. So that's why it's not, uh, most of them bloom without their foliage, kind of like the um, Amaryllis belladonna. Yeah, I have a lot of Sarnariensis types and uh, they seem to get leaves and flowers about the same time. Oh, the, the other ones do? Okay. Um, yeah, the Sarnariensis types, the, um, what's the, the, the main one? About Baudinii? That one, um, I'm waiting for, for new flowers to come, but I think that might be another month or so before I'll see anything. Okay. Does anybody else grow uh, Nirene and have anything to say about it? I like them. I grow it. Mine, uh, the leaves come up and then they go down like emeralds. Mine are pink. Are you, do you have some blooming right now? No, not yet. They come much later. Oh. Mine don't bloom yet either. So maybe this one's a little earlier than normal. Gorgeous, pure white. I love it. With the little frilly edges. And the roughly edges too. Yeah. Okay, this is my favorite. <laughs> I've got lots of eucomas this month. Yeah, uh, they're, they're all blooming right now. Um, this one's freckles. I have quite a few um, eucomas. Are you showing more of them? I will. You want to yeah. go to the next one? Um, yeah, I think they're kind of, well, you say this one is um, a cross. Uh, that lay lay eye, which I think is golden state bulbs, was produces a lot of those, and I and some of them I have are that particular one, and I also have a bander mirwai. I didn't take a picture of it. It's just still teeny tiny, but it's got the little freckly spots too. What was it called? The bander mirwai. Oh, the other parent or whatever. Yeah, it has oh. freckles on it too. Oh, interesting. Uh, Judy Wong, who's, who I think after yours is, uh, gave me uh, little freckles the other like, couple of years ago, and it's still really tiny. But uh, dang, raccoon knocked it over <gasps> the pot. Oh uh, no! It was up on its head for a couple of days, but it looks like it's going to survive. Okay, so that's one, which is really a cutie. And here's a couple others from Charlotte's yes, garden. Yeah. So Oakhurst is kind of the biggest one and the darkest one. And the, the other two, you know, I kind of lost track of what's what. Um, a lot of them are Camosa background and there's one called Coco, but I'm not sure which one's that. And there's T mm -hmm. Tagula Ruby, and I don't know which one is that. And so they're all euphemists. <laughs> I have Oakhurst in a pot and it's really, really showy for the longest time. I mean, it goes totally dormant in the wintertime, but it has been blooming, I think, since June. I mean, it has a really long blooming season. You're a little earlier, but um, I've had good leaves for quite a while, but the flower finally came up. It, they weren't up when I sent you freckles. 
and all these other oh. flowers have emerged since freckles. Wow. Yeah, mine's been up for quite a while. Yours was spectacular, Ellen. I saw it last month. Yeah, it's it's really been a real satisfying plan. I'm getting to like these a lot. <laughs> There's a cute one in the botanical garden, but I couldn't find a name on it. It's mm. it's very short and squat and has little fat inflorescences. Mm. Fat fluorescences, I would say. Fat. What color are they, short Charlotte? Fat. They're kind of white. Hmm. Thank you, Charlotte. I think that's what you have all you had, right? Probably. Because I think we're going into transition to Judy's uh, eucomus. So I uh, got these, gosh, I can't remember where I got them, but the camosa is kind of the straight species. And it, as you said, it's called pineapple lily. It's uh, inflorescence or long blooming. Like you said, yours has been blooming since June, but it blooms from the bottom to the top. It's a good pollinator for bees and for butterflies and does grow very well in containers. Yours was particularly a fine specimen, but they grow about one and a half to two feet high and equal in width. As you can see from Charlotte's, um, they have the various cultivars have different color flowers as well as leaves. And the purplish seeds that appear after the flowers die up really prolong its uh, ornamental value. The one on the left is freckles. And this, as you mentioned, was a crossing that was done by Terra Nova. It's uh, got the spotted leaves, the wavy margins, and it has a vigorous clumping dwarf habit because I think I've given some to you. I think I gave some to Mark Delapine, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it just really offsets quite well. Nice. And it uh, it's an excellent pot plant. Uh, and I got this at Peacock Nursery years ago. I think that's where I got mine too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They must have a big clump that they can a little. <laughs> I guess. Uh, you know, that's a lot of plants. Offsets. Yeah, he gets a lot of plants from Terra Nova. Ah, okay. Hard to find. Yeah, I remember seeing that they were starting a whole bunch of them, just the the um, single um, bulbs. And then when I went back later, they had a whole bunch of them that had grown up. So they're, like I said, they offset pretty easily and they seem to grow pretty well. Um, mine's is kind of underneath a redwood tree a little bit. So it gets a lot of bright shade and um, it's real happy there. Oh, Those little tufts of leaves at the top of the flower heads going to be, you know, are they usable as offsets? No, no. Oh, that oh. actually was how it gets the name of pineapple lily because it looks like what a pineapple oh, does, the tufts does. on the top. It does. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. On mine, mine's in a pretty big container. I um, have put a, like a saucer on top of it when it goes dormant totally in the wintertime. Uh, another plot on top of it just to disguise the uh, keep, yeah keep the rain water. off yeah I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not to keep the rain off <laughs> I think so because <laughs> mines are under the redwood tree so they don't get a lot of uh, they don't get they don't get soggy I think that's important yeah they're not getting so soggy with the saucer on top for sure <laughs> yeah okay uh, I don't know how many people have grown this this is a very fragrant flower Magnolia champaco, it used to be Michaelia, and it's from China, and it's an esteemed tree of the Hindus and the Buddhists, and it's often seen growing on temple grounds. It can be a shrub or a small tree, and it is evergreen, although in where I am in zone nine, it is a little bit semi-deciduous. It's really recommended for zones 10 to 12, but it's very, very fragrant. I really wish I could send the fragrance over the the computer because it's really wonderful and late afternoon you can it wastes all through the garden it's got the really glossy foliage but it does need regular water and even more water in extreme heat this is a sentimental plant for me because it was my mother's favorite plant and i grew it in a pot which is probably about mm, 10 inches across and it's um raised within a, a bottom saucer so that it's not sitting quite in water, but the, probably the bottom of the pot is um, has access to water all the time. It's growing in a sheltered south facing side of the yard and it does receive uh, morning sun to early afternoon sun. And it's sheltered by the redwood tree in winter. So the flowers have been used in making uh, perfume. Nice. So does it have a gardenia type fragrance or like the banana plant, which is a Michaelia? No, neither of those. I'm trying to think how what somebody described. A little bit 
kind of vanillish, but really rich. I mean, it, when you smell it, you kind of go like, what is that? Mm, nice. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't grow these in my garden, but I did go to a garden where I saw them recently and I was pretty impressed with them. So I thought I'd just share them in case people aren't familiar with them. The one on the left is an acanthus, acanthus mollus, white water is the cultivar. And it's a vigorous variegated acanthus. It has the very striking bold leaves uh, that acanthus has and deeply cut white margins and splashing on the leaves, which I thought was very pretty in the shade. It forms a fairly large clump, about four feet tall, and uh, has the showy flower stalks with pink and cream flowers in the summertime. And this was bred, I guess, with acanthus summer beauty, um, which I'm not familiar with, but to give it more vigor, hardiness, heat, and humidity uh, tolerance. It does do well in, it says full sun, but we saw it in pretty, I thought, deep shade, but it needs average fertile soil and medium moisture and well-drained soil. So um, if your summers are hot, which is where I saw it, it does need uh, part shade and uh, it will survive in deep shade, but might, uh, may not flower as well there. So it's a zone seven to 10. It grows about 36 inches high, 36 inches wide, and uh, the flower stalks can be up to four feet. So um, blooms June and July. The other plant on the other side is a podocarpus, and I'd never seen this before. Um, this is a podocarpus elongatus, and um, it has the uh, cultivar name Monmal, which was given by Monrovia Nursery who uh, introduced it and marketed it in 2004. It's a Cape, a common name is Cape Yellowwood. And this is really interesting because it really has distinctive blue foliage. I mean, it's really blue like that. And it'll ultimately grow about 15 to 25 feet tall with an upright pyramidal form. So it fits in really nice into a relatively small space. Grows 10 to 12 inches a year, has those narrow two inch long leaves that emerge kind of a light green blue, and then they age to an unusual kind of a cool gray blue. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be planted in part sun to light shade and needs to be irrigated regularly. Cold hardy, uh, supposedly down to 20 or 25 and can be grown in USDA zones nine to 11. The dense growth, it really does can get dense, uh, makes it a great choice for specimen planting, which is how it was used when I saw it. And it can be sheared and it can even be made into a topiary, which would be a shame to do to those beautiful leaves, I yeah. think. Right. Yeah, but it drops few leaves. So it's it, it would be good near a walkway or a patio or a pool. And uh, this is from um, selected from a form of Podocarpus elongatus that grows in the rent, winter rainfall Part of the Western Cape, and it usually grows along rivers and on rocky outcrops with the Fainbos uh, vegetation type. Uh, it's distinguished from other South African yellow woods by its relatively elongated gray blue leaves and the bushy habit. Like I said, this was a seedling selection introduced into the California nursery trade by Monrovia in 2004. And there's been no report of this plant setting cones. So it hasn't been determined if this is a deciduous conifer uh, that is, or di dioecious conifer rather, that is either male or female. So they really don't know. So it's normally this blue in uh, its native habitat is elongatus or is this a particularly blue um, selection or? It says, um, let's see, it was, it's a selected form of elongatus. It has the elongated gray green, gray blue leaves. Yeah, you said it was grown from a cutting, so that wouldn't be what mm, It was introduced by a seedling. It was a seedling. Oh, uh huh. Yeah, it was a seedling that, yeah, that was selected um, and then introduced by Monrovia. Hmm. I was just wondering if elongatus was more green normally, and this is a... Oh, the normal elongatus? Um, yeah. I don't know, but I was thinking icy blue. I would think that this is uh, particular to this particular cultivar, but, but the, yeah, it was I really, it was, it was yeah. stunning. It was really stunning. Hey, Judy, I'm wondering um, how how much shade it can tolerate because and and still keep that color. You mentioned part shade. Um, yeah, you know where I saw it, it was kind of in um, 
kind of close to the eaves. It was kind of in a, a protected uh, porch area that had a large, had a planting area. Um, I don't know if it gets reflected light off of the walls on the other side, but um, it says, it says plant in full sun to part sun or light shade, but I saw it in very part shade. I wouldn't uh -huh. say, I, it didn't look like it ever got full sun. And I was going to say, since it was growing right next to the acanthus, I wouldn't think it'd be very happy in full sun. Um, do you remember uh, where that was facing? Um, Ooh. I think it's is this north. By the front doors? I think it's north. Wow. Okay. Great. Oh. Facing north. Uh, yeah. I've seen this in full sun, and it looked kind of washed out there. I thought it was uh -huh. much more much prettier in the part shade here because it's really an accent. It's lovely here. Yeah, yeah. I thought the color was fabulous. I mean, Especially with really, that dark background of that. Yeah, it really brightened up that whole corner, I thought. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm here. Hey there. Mm -hmm. You have their uh, lily. Is this um, your only one of your lilies that you have? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. This type? Uh, the Mardigan lily, yeah. yeah. I I'm not sure if it's the same as a Turk's cap, but they uh, or a Turk's cap, but they went in the same. As it, for, as far as my reading, it was uh, either type of uh, Turk's cap. I'm not sure if other lilies are named that as well, but it was is also known as the uh, Turk's cap lily. Yes. I'm reading on the on the screen here. I grow this in full sun, and it seems to do okay. Um, all day sun. Okay, and, but well, you're coastal to it. It doesn't say that it won't, it just says that it would tolerate more shade than other lilies. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I took it to the um, local uh, fair and the judges weren't too impressed with it, apparently. <laughs> I didn't get anything for it in any ribbon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, they, I they wanting like to grow that one. <laughs> the sprays yeah, I love flow it. small flowers on it. Did you get it at a um, already growing or did you get it as a bulb or? You know, I've had it. I brought it up from California. So I must have had it six, seven years now. I was so busy, you know, digging stuff up and potting it. I, I don't know whether it was in the ground or in a pot. Can't remember. Has it bloomed before um, for you then? Uh, I think last year it may have bloomed. Yeah, but it took a couple of years up here before it, I saw any bloom on it. Yeah, I think that this is really Lilium speciosum. Mm. Uh, Mardigan would not have those uh, bumps on the petals toward the oh. base. And Turk's cap is really just a type uh, or a flower type. So lots of lilies are referred to as Turk's cap types. Mardigan is, uh, speciosum is, uh, many, many sorts are. Our native leopard lily is, um, but I'm almost certain this is Lilium speciosum. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's good to know. Sure. Okay. Okay, so I will change that before it goes into a mm -hmm. website there. Oh, and it should be very fragrant. I mean, um, speciosum is very fragrant. Mm -hmm. The, the blooms last a long time, even after cutting. I'd say probably more than a week in the base. Okay. And then we have a uh, question here. Yeah, I brought these up from California as well. A, a gardening friend of mine, she grows a lot of cactus and she offered them to me and they were a lot, they're about half the size when we brought them up. And they seem to do fine. Um, they're against the south wall where it gets really hot in the summer. Um, but I don't know what kind of cactus it is. They bloom in the daytime, it looks like, yes, correct? Yes, yes. Not night blooming. Anybody have any cactus uh, expertise? We'll have to send this to Brian. Uh, the blooms don't last very long, a few days, and then they get really ugly. They're spectacular. Right. You said they're fragrant as well, or not? A little bit, yeah. My nose isn't very sensitive, so. I think it's a type of Echinopsis, but not positive which one, but pretty sure. How do you spell that? E-C-H-I-N-O? P-S-I-S. -S. 
Oh, oh, okay. Thanks. Good night. Thank you, Bart. Sure. Okay, and then tell us about these. Yeah, this was a garden that we went to over the weekend along the coast because we were in the middle of a heat wave up here. We just had to get away from all that high heat. Um, and what we went to see roses, but one of the gardens, the, the guy that grew the roses, the exhibition roses, was also a hybridizer and grower of dahlias. Oh, I was amazed. I mean, huge blooms and absolutely beautiful. It was just stupendous. Just so intense colors. Yeah, they're, they're gorgeous. It must be the weather there along the coast must be uh, conducive to growing them better than where we're located more inland where it's warmer. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, I've been to the Mendocino Botanic Garden in like September, October, and they always have a wonderful display of dahlias. If you really get, I have to go see some dahlias. Okay. Yeah, they do. I, I've always missed them because I'm too early or too late, usually too early, but I've seen the uh, spot for them. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, are you in here? Oh. There we go. Yes, he is. Okay. So I don't know if that's these are correct. I kind of identified from my knowledge, but I may be totally off base. Okay. The reason I put the tree in there is I had no idea what it is. <laughs> and it's uh, in my yard and it's been growing there. So uh, the, the other ones, it, it, the other two photographs are both of the same plant, so the close up of the flower. And the flowers, those, those little flowers are really only uh, more than hardly an eighth of an inch across, less than a quarter anyway. And I didn't know what it was. Is there any fragrance, Richard? No, not, not that I can tell. No. Does anybody have any thoughts other than what I put in? No, you're correct, Ellen. It's okay. a California pepper tree that is not native to California. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's actually from Peru. And then uh, the Verbena bonariensis is South American as well. And it does come up from seed, uh, just as, as mentioned there in the write-up. Uh, it can be kind of invasive in certain situations. It is, oh. the Shinus mola is on the invasive species list for California. <laughs> it is definitely a no-no <laughs> plant, but I love it. I Definitely naturalized in Southern California. I didn't realize it was dioecious, though. That's where they're invasive, because they really yeah. crowd out all the natives. Um, I, I'm in Marin now. I, when I was in San Francisco, we had one in the backyard, which really required water. If you didn't water, it would start to die. So mm -hmm. I'm surprised. Mm -hmm. Do you know where in Peru it's from, Bart? Um, I'm forgetting, but the thing is, it's um, it it is pretty drought tolerant. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that there were, there were lots of them in Hollister where I was, where I grew up and that they were in areas where they never got watered. And again, its biggest problem or its biggest flaw is that it tends to be somewhat weak wooded. And so they get kind of magnificent spreads on them and nice and weeping growth habit but then big branches will break off um, and they don't really recover well from that. Uh, but it's, um, it is a pretty tree. And yes, it is a pest in certain situations. In Southern California, it tends to be more a riparian thing. Uh, and I know along the San Diego River, it's not what I'd say is abundant, but it's definitely around. Almost any of the Shinus uh, group, Shinus polygamus, Shinus terebinthifolia, and Shinus mole, uh, all are, are somewhat to very much pest plants in California. Okay. Um, I have a question. Are the peppers ever used as, uh, peppercorns ever used as pepper? Not that I'm aware of, but I think you probably could, but... I'm not aware of it. Yeah, they said the ancient uh, Aztecs used to use, evidently outside it was used for a drink. The inside, I think, is not so great. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't remember exactly all that, but yeah. 
Okay, thank you, Richard. Thank you. And then beautiful crinum oh, looking. Oh, that's beautiful. This is something I moved up to Marin from uh, San Francisco. And it's like, it's so hot up here, it has to be in the shade. It just, <laughs> they don't like the hot, the hot weather. It's interesting because I, I know they're from Africa. At least I think they are. So, uh, but it's very fragrant, very nice. And I have a couple of them. How tall is this one? It, it, most crinums you see really tall and kind of. Well, that's, this is. Uh, like this looks compact. This is only about oh, two feet above the top of the pot. So it, 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 it's, uh, it's a split off from an, an earlier one. So it's not as old as, they, as some of them are. But was, was it always this compact? Well, this is the first. Yeah, I think it has been for about two years now. That's all. But the, another one I have or had was much larger. Tall wise or wide wise? Yes. Oh, both. It was it was about okay. five feet tall and, and and could get the three about three feet of spread of these these leaves. Oh, okay. Um, but they're very I fragrant. Thinking, I was thinking this was a nice compact one. I, I was really attracted to it. Okay, Connie has brought us some problems again, you guys. So what are these on, Connie? Uh, I think I think the, the the yellow on the leaves. I think it's rust. And then there's a little worm that's been eating my raspberries. The leaf folds up and there's a white sticky substance. And when I pull it open, there's a worm inside. And I, I'm curious what it, what it is and uh, how to treat it. So is this on the left, um, the um, berry? That's the raspberry, right? Yeah, here. okay. And that's yeah. the underside of the leaf. And then the, what's the plant on the right? I think it's a tomato. Okay. But it's been, I, I've seen the same thing on, on the apple tree and on the raspberry. I have seen uh, rust on berries. Does anybody have any insight? Bonnie? Hi. Um, Hi I, have, I have a worm in my garden that does that. And it's a brown apple moth, a light brown apple moth. Because it likes apples. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you do anything to get rid of it? No. Just, do you pick the leaves off and you know and throw them away or what? If I oh if I see it, I'll squeeze it and kill it. Usually, if there's not enough or not a lot that they're, you know, if they're not totally. That's true. There's only Usually. a few. One one here, one there, one here. There's not that many. Okay. Anyhow, I don't know so, if that's what so it is. So I really don't. I don't know if that's what you that's have, tiny. but I have, it's very, very tiny. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. What your tolerance level is? These are these are, <laughs> these are caterpillars. They're not worms. They're the larva of either a butterfly or a moth. And this is what many of our songbirds need to feed to their their young when they're raising them. So if it's not doing a whole lot of damage, I would just leave it and let the birds eat them. Okay. Okay. So so it's you know it's not a you know not 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 that bad. It's, you know, it's, and it's, you know, if it's going to become a butterfly, you know, that's okay with me. Every caterpillar. What about becomes, the rust? Every, every caterpillar becomes a butterfly or a moth. Every single one of them does. Yeah, although this one, I, I, I agree with that, that it is probably LBAM, the light brown apple moth, yeah. which is something that the exactly. state of California is, uh, um, actively against. Uh, it's an exotic pest that's been brought in and it's and it affects all kinds of plants, including a number of economic plants like apples, etc, much like you said. Um, the thing that uh, I mean normally you would say yes uh, to what Andrew was saying about them uh, being great food for birds except as you notice that it folds the leaf uh, and hides in there so that you can't, or that birds can't find it. And that it only ventures out usually after dark. Um, and that if you unfold the leaf, they usually drop down and squiggle a lot uh, to try and avoid whatever has disturbed them. I, I agree with the earlier suggestion. Yeah, you just squash them. Or if you want to, you can just uh, peel open the leaf 
and make sure that it falls to the ground and then hope that a bird finds it before it scrambles onto something else. Okay, great. So does anybody have any ideas on how to get rid of the rust on um, the blackberry? Or I don't know what that berry, some type of berry. I know there's fungicides, but Raspberry. anybody have any practical knowledge on that? I think you can um, go to the nursery and get fungicide. I'm not sure if sulfur works on that or not, but I'm not sure if it's uh, you're able to just tolerate it or if it's something you actually do have to control. If it's just unsightly or if it really affects the um, production of the berries, I don't know. And you might want to hold off on poisonous things if you're picking your berries. Right. Right. Yeah, for sure. right. That's that's the concern. If you know to put what I put on something that's edible is you know I want to be very careful. Yeah. So if it's you know it's producing fine, you may want to just enjoy the beautiful color. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then uh, Connie has the stop the plant again. Does uh, anybody have any new ideas for this? You can go ahead and tell us about us, Connie. Yeah, it's it's a very strange plant. It's growing in all directions, and it in it and there's a lot of variety. Some of it's green, some of it's purple, some of it's woody, some of the leaves are feathery and some are solid. And if you can spotlight me, I, I cut some, oh, yeah. some small branches to show the, you know, show the, in, you know, so you can see more than just the, the mass of it. Can we see you? Actually, let me. Maybe this will help. Oh, there dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and let there be light. Yeah. Okay. And this is one branch. Oh my gosh. This is another. Okay, you have to be slower so we can uh, focus on it there. Okay. Does this help? Yeah. That looks totally vigorous, big time. Oh, it's very, very, very. <laughs> you know, that's that's part of the problem. Any thoughts, anybody? And then, and then I have another one where it's really dense like this. So I'm hoping somebody can figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going in all directions, isn't it? Yeah, is it yeah. I mean, it's just like a, you know. No, no, it had. It's growing out of a big stump that has multiple, multiple, uh, multiple stumps growing in, in different directions. It's really the weirdest thing I've seen in a long time. Okay, well, we'll have to ponder that and see if anybody comes up with anything. Um, you might want to post okay. it on the Facebook well, page what... too. Or send it to Mark to uh, okay. the, uh, Facebook page and see if anybody. Is there any way other than Facebook? I don't do Facebook. Send it to any Mark and see if he can to... put it on Facebook. Okay. I'm volunteering his services. I don't know if that's so cool, but um, okay. I'm sure he'd do it if he has, has time. I don't know what he's up to. Obviously, he's missing tonight, but um, you might see if he can do that for you. That might be another least expose it to other people so maybe give you some ideas. So uh, my friend Angelica has um, been watching uh, monarch butterflies. So Angelica, do you want to uh, go through all your stuff or do you want me to read it and you'll make comments or how do you want to do that? Well, we can quickly go through the pictures. They are pretty self-explanatory. 
But okay. normally I don't rear butterflies. I do have so a big patch of common milkweed in my yard and I do flower arrangements. So one day I look at my flower arrangement and there is a monarch caterpillar on it. And because the weather was so bad, I didn't dare to throw it out right away to the milkweed patch and read up a little bit and realized that only a very, very low percentage of all eggs that are being laid will survive and succeed. And um, it talked about being between two to 10%, but to be honest, I kind of watched my, mil watched my milkweed and I never really saw a larger caterpillar or you know, a chrysalis coming out. So I started feeding that little guy fresh plants or fresh leaves rather, and didn't realize that with the leaves, I brought eggs in. And from the eggs grew, came, emerged the larva. And so you see the stages from the egg, when you see the little neighboring egg with a little black spot that's already the head of the larva coming out or being visible. And well, so it continues. I just really had fun. It was a real great experience. So I took a lot of nice. pictures. <laughs> so you can see how tiny this is with the, the you know, here's the big leaf and these, this is the bottom of this particular plant's leaves. Yeah, those are the, the hairs on the leaf underside. So the butterfly only lays about one egg on the underside of a milkweed. And um, the larva goes through five molding start, uh, stages. And with increasing um, size, it's a little bit misleading because all my pictures, in all my pictures, a caterpillar looks about the same size, but in reality, it wasn't. I just tried to really make it show. And when you see the dots on the legs, like here, you know that it's already a bigger caterpillar that's ready to um, transform into a chrysalis. And you see how he's hanging here. He's already ready to go wandering off. The first one I found on my um, plants, on my flower arrangement, actually disappeared. And I first thought my cats were the culprits, but about 15 days after it disappeared, I had a monarch butterfly on my fly screen. So it <laughs> took it about 14 days and I noticed that they kind of hang around a little longer before they really are ready to fly off. Do you want to go on, Ellen? Okay, evidently they start eating on the inside of the leaf and then they go to the edges, you said? Right, when they're very, very small, the first instars make little holes and they're kind of telltale holes if you look at a milkweed plant. And then when they get bigger, they start eating from the leaf edge inside. And then when they're getting ready to transform, they just hang themselves upside down on something and actually they can wander quite a bit. They will often go away from the feed plant up to about 30 feet away and to find something that they find comfortable. And then they very slowly basically mold into the chrysalis. And what's left over is that little thing down here that looks really weird, which is kind of, you know, portions of the skin of the legs of their antenna, so. <laughs> Almost like they're taking off their um, caterpillar coat and leaving their little caterpillar coat down there. Except these are the, you said the stripes from the original caterpillar here. Yeah, you still see that a little bit. Crystals. <laughs> and it takes about um, 10 to 14 days, which depends on the temperature. The warmer it is, the quicker actually the animal develops. And then in the end, you have for the longest period of the chrysalis stage, this beautiful jade green um, form, which later transforms into a little bit bluish color into black. And once you see it, you already can see there the, the pattern of the wings uh, showing through. Um, about a day before the animal comes out, the, the mature animal, um, the chrysalis the outside becomes transparent and um, you basically really can, can see the, the shape, the dots on the body and uh, the color patterns on the wing. And then wow. it opens up and it slowly kind of plops out head first. 
that whole period goes very, very fast to coming out. And notice how big his abdomen is here. Evidently, it's filled with um, Angelica. I got the story. Yes. Uh, filled with liquids, and then, um, of course, and that's all the, the abdomen there as well. And then uh, I'll let you continue. And right there. Yeah, it's it's very amazing that actually everything fits. You have to um, picture that's a larger. The caterpillar before it transforms is about oh two three eighths of an inch long. And um, the whole chrysalis is only a little over an inch. So that whole animal shrinks down. And then, you know, all this is coming out of that tiny little, <laughs> tiny little um, encasing. Um, here you see how it slowly starts pumping the body fluids into the wings, into the body to um, enlarge the wings. And um, in the literature, I've read that it takes about one hour to have the wings fully pumped up and ready to fly. But my experience really was that the butterflies hang around much, much longer before they fly off. And it might have to do with the fact that we had cooler days again. So I don't know. Like I said, the cooler it is, the more time they're taking to completely mature. Yeah. So all that fluid goes into their wings and then evidently they excrete some of that as well. As you can see how skinny the uh, nice. skinny little abdomen oh. is there. And that's just, I also learned how to differentiate between the male and the female. You see those tiny little clans here, which are actually scent clans um, that the male carries and the female doesn't have those. So you can oh, tell after nice. the butterfly emergence what's a male and a female. And of course, you would be able, if you really closely look at the body, to see differences there too. But usually we don't get that close to a butterfly. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Angelica. Now, now we all have uh, parlor games we can play with. Stump our friends with, how do you tell a monarch, monarch male from a monarch female? I love <laughs> it. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing all your plants and animals. And um, in the next month, we've been waiting a long time to see oh, cool. uh, As you, as you guys remember, he was here, or he was supposed to be here in June. But he hit, got hit by a car. Luckily, he was not hurt seriously, but he did spend the night in the hospital. Well, he was so enthused about doing the presentation. And it was, uh, you know, when we talked to him the next day, he was so uh, embarrassed and um, stuff beyond his control, obviously. So um, I'm looking forward to his talk next week or next month. And uh, he has a lot of interesting theories on planting things together so they'll make... Um, for animals and for um, year round interest and such. So I think it should be a really good nice. program. Uh, Bart and I, and I'm not sure. Oh, Judy and uh, Tosh and uh, went down to Chile and we, we actually saw this garden and some of his other gardens, which was really fun as well as, as well as his home garden. Okay, thank you all for coming and we'll- Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.